Hello everyone. Welcome back to the series on decarbonizing transport in emerging economies. I am Deepthi Jain, Assistant Professor at Transportation Research and Injury Prevention Center, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Today I will be discussing about how do we model the demand for active mobility and again over here I am going to discuss examples from Indian case studies. First, we need to understand why we want to model the travel, travel demand. We obviously want to understand what is the existing travel demand and where is it getting generated, how and where the people are traveling. We also want to identify the factors that determine the demand, which include, for example, what are the factors that influence the distance of travel and which factors influence the choice of modes. And these can include, for example, individual related, household related, infrastructure related and environment related variables. We also want to understand that if certain policies are taken up or if inactions are there, in both the scenarios, how the travel demand will change. If we are including or introducing a new mode of transport with the help of revealed preferences and stated preferences can also help us knowing that how and from where the travel demands will shift whether people will be willing to pay for this new introduced choices and what are the relative price elasticities. These are some of the things that one may want to explore when they want to model the travel demand. Overall, modeling travel demand can help you in better understanding the impact of action and inactions in the future. So let us first conceptualize what is the travel demand. Let's consider there is a location 1 where the people are living and they need to access this location 2 where the people are working. Now they need to travel a certain distance to be able to reach from location 1 to location 2 which is going to incur certain cost. While the cost is incurred by the people However, there are associated benefits with respect to accessing that location too. Now, based on the cost, individual preferences and availability and capability of individuals, they choose a certain mode that finally also helps in determining the routes. Now, active modes are different from modeling the mechanized modes. Essentially, the active modes are the short distance trips. While for mechanized modes, many of the variables, for example, the cost, monetary cost and travel time might be considered. But in case of active modes, one need to consider the seven key principles that is building conducive built environment, building and developing connected places, having continuous infrastructure, and provisioning comfortable and safe streets. Also, building a secure environment with lively streets. So these seven key principles can also become part of modeling the active modes, which is going to be different from modeling a mechanized mode. Conventionally, we have a four-step travel demand model that is applied for understanding the travel demand in existing condition and the future scenarios. The first step includes trip generation, which helps in estimating the number of trips that are happening in the cities. It is irrespective of where these trips are going. The second step includes trip distribution. These are basically the number of trips that are happening between pair of zones. The third step is the model split. This steps helps in distributing trip distribution matrix to the trip distribution matrix by the modes of transport. Therefore, we get to know which modes will be used for a certain trip. And the last step includes route assignment. 
Now this root assignment helps in allocating the demand from the trip generation, trip distribution and model split to the different road network or links. Modeling demand for active modes will require an alternate approach. This would include first understanding what is the existing demand for active mobility in the city. Second step would include defining potential demand. This can be estimated using an alternate scenario based analysis. The third step will require doing a root choice model to understand how people make their choices for different routes. And the fourth step then would include preparing a network assignment model where the estimated demand is distributed on different road network links. Then, then after this, we can prepare our infrastructure plan. Planning process for active mobility will include estimating demand on the links and thereafter preparing an active mobility master plan. The active mobility master plan should have a network plan which is based on the estimated demand in through the travel demand models. Second, it should also have a detailed infrastructure design and facilities plan and a detailed implementation plan which will include drawings, costings and specifications. Such a plan should be evaluated every five years. The facilities should be monitored for the change in the number of fatalities and active mode usage in the city. Alternate scenarios can be considered while modeling the active demand. The first scenario may consider an improvement in active mobility infrastructure, which would include provision of footpaths and bicycles and the policies that encourage active modes, discouraging the mechanized modes. A second scenario would include estimating an impact of improvisation of public transport services along with an integrated improvement of active mobility infrastructure. Such a scenario would also therefore show an increase in public transport usage and thereby increase in active mobility demand because every public transport user will be an active mode user while accessing or regressing the public transport system. A third scenario may be considered wherein an alteration in the built environment or urban form is considered. For example, having a compact city, a dense and high mixed land use intensity city. Such a scenario would therefore can cause a reduction in the travel distance and therefore impact the choice for active mobility. A fourth scenario may be considered where all the three scenarios are combined together. That include improvising active mode infrastructure, having better provision of public transport services, a compact city development and policies that influence the use of motorized modes. As a result of these alternate scenarios, what we are expecting is a reduced trip length, an increase in bicycle share and increased public transport share. While we are looking at increase in public transport share, we are also expecting an increase in the number of people walking and bicycling to be able to reach the public transport services. I am going to discuss about the data requirement for modeling active modes. When we are doing a four step model, we divide the city in number of zones with an assumption that, is, that the centroid of these zones are the locations from where all the trips are getting generated and all the trips are getting terminated in that zone. Conventional travel demand models consider a very large size zones for models. Now when we are doing a third step which is mode choice, 
and the fourth step which is route assignment these both the steps are considering interzonal trips and for every pair of zones we have an impedance or a cost associated with it now when we are considering these last size zones then essentially all the intrazonal trips are lost and these interzonal trips that happen are essentially the long distance trips this results in missing out on the short distance trips that are catered by, by walking and bicycling and if that happens then we are not going to plan infrastructure based on the demand in the future years now this is taking examples from multiple mobility plans that have been developed for indian cities and what i'm showing over here is the average zone size used or the traffic analysis zone size used in these studies we see in most of the studies we have the zone size which is greater than or equal to 3 square kilometers however when we consider our consider our trip length distribution then we see that approximately 60% of the trips that happen by walk are less than 1 km long and if i am looking at bicycle trips then the same percentage or 80% of the trips are shorter than 5 km now consider that we have a city divided in in a form of grid with a cell size of 1.5 square kilometers that means we will have a cell edge of 1.22 kilometers resulting in an interzonal distance of 1.22 kilometers so even if we are looking at a zone size of 1.5 kilometers we are essentially going to miss out on 60 to 70% of the trips that happen by walk so now i'm going to take you through this example of vishakhapatnam on what data was available and how we could delineate the small size zones to be able to account for short distance trips as the interzonal trips now in vishakhapatnam we had data from ward level with a total study area of 516 square kilometers and a population size of 1.7 million with an average area of the wards being 5.3 square kilometers the maximum area of the ward was 78.33 square kilometers now considering considering the trip length distribution of walking and bicycling in the city of vishakhapatnam 70% of the trips by walk were shorter than 500 meters and then if we are looking at bicycle trips then approximately the trips were shorter than 2 km on the left hand side i am showing you showing you the ward map of the city of vishakhapatnam and we can see essentially the wards that are there in the periphery of the city are the last size wards not only the size of the wards is going to be a problem over here but also because we are considering that the centroids of the zones are the locations from the locations from where the trips are getting generated and destined now these are the wards especially in the periphery of the city that have sparse development therefore it may happen that the centroid of the zone is very far away or is distinct from the settlement so how do we define our fine scale zone for study firstly we define what is an appropriate size of the zone uh, here i'm trying to show the three different zone size with size ranging from 175 meters by 175 meters to 300 meters by 300 meters so with the smallest size zone we can expect that the interzonal distance will be at least 175 meters and for the largest size zones the maximum distance between any two pair of zone will be 300 meters now we looked at the city of vishakhapatna and firstly we identified our boundaries for modeling the travel demand 
within that boundary we mapped the built area that is existing within that boundary from that built up area we excluded all the natural boundaries and also mapped the road layers then we intersected the ward boundaries the roads and the built up and the natural areas to come up with the zones that are going to be small enough on for maximum of the short distance trips as a result we defined them as nmt tz we could get around 1300 uh, nmt tz an area ranging from 0.02 square kilometers to 0.43 square kilometers